Welcome to our segment on star clusters and supernova. These are two very important items for our distance ladder, and they're strikingly beautiful. We'll start off with star clusters, move into supernova, and then cover the significant addition to our distance ladder that these objects have made. There are two kinds of clusters. Open clusters, usually a few hundred young stars lightly bound by gravity, and globular clusters, like this one. Hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of older stars tightly bound by gravity. The Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, is a cluster of extremely luminous blue stars. It is one of only a few open clusters whose distance can be measured by a parallax. This image is a close-up view of the jewel box cluster taken by Hubble. Several very bright pale blue supergiant stars, a solitary ruby red supergiant, and a variety of other brilliantly colored stars are visible in the image. The huge variety in brightness exists because the brighter stars are 15 to 20 times the mass of the Sun, while the dimmest stars are less than half the mass of the Sun. The small open star cluster Primus 24 lies at the core of the large emission nebula NGC 6357. We'll cover emission nebula in another segment on the Milky Way. The brightest object in the picture is designated Prismus 24-1. It was once thought to weigh as much as 200 times the mass of the Sun. However, the high-resolution Hubble Space Telescope images of the star show that it is really two stars orbiting one another. NGC 6791 is one of the oldest and largest open clusters known. It is 10 times larger than most open clusters and contains roughly 10,000 stars. 47 Toucanet is one of the densest globular clusters in the southern hemisphere, containing around a million stars. Multiple Hubble photos of this region allow astronomers to track the beehive swarm motion of stars. Using Doppler shifts and proper motion measurements, precise velocities were obtained for nearly 15,000 stars in this cluster. This has provided astronomers with the best observational evidence to date that globular clusters sort out stars according to their mass, governed by a gravitational billiard ball game between the stars. Heavier stars slow down and sink to the cluster's core while lighter stars pick up speed and move across the cluster to its periphery. Omega Centauri is among the biggest and most massive of some 200 globular clusters in the Milky Way. Hubble snapped this panoramic view of a colorful assortment of 100,000 stars residing in the crowded core of a giant cluster that contains nearly 10 million stars. All of the stars in the image are cozy neighbors. The average distance between any two stars in the cluster's crowded core is only about a third of a light year. Penetrating 25,000 light years of obstructing dust and stars, Hubble uses infrared to provide the clearest view yet of a pair of the largest young clusters of stars in our Milky Way. They are located less than 100 light years from the very center of the galaxy. Arches cluster is so dense, over 100,000 of its stars would fill a spherical region that only contains five stars in our local neighborhood. The quintuplet cluster is home to the brightest star in the galaxy called the Pistol Star. Here we're zooming into our final and most distant cluster, M30. 
Globular cluster M30 is a dense swarm of several hundred thousand stars. It's about 90 light years across. Here's the Helix Planetary Nebula creation clip. You'll recall that planetary nebula are the result of a main sequence star exploding at the end of its life. This is called a nova, and it is the expected end for the Sun, and most stars less than five times the mass of the Sun. The star left behind at the end is called a white dwarf. The typical white dwarf is around the mass of the Sun, but packed into a star about the size of the Earth. It's so dense that a spoonful of it would weigh several tons here on Earth. For massive red supergiant stars, a different end is in store. Here's a clip on what the Crab Nebula supernova may have looked like. The explosion at the end is billions of times larger than the nova. A supernova may shine with the magnitude of 11 billion suns. The total energy output can be as much as the total output of our Sun during its entire 13 billion year lifetime. The star left behind at the end is called a neutron star. If the star was massive enough, the supernova could even leave behind a black hole. The typical neutron star is around one and a half times the mass of the Sun but packed into a star about the size of Poway, California. It's so dense that a spoonful of it would weigh 10 million tons. Here's what the daytime sky might look like if and when Betelgeuse supernovas. The luminosity of a supernova depends on the mass of the star. If we knew the mass, we'd have ourselves another standard candle. But for most explosions across the cosmos, we don't have that information. But there is one scenario where we do. It's called a Type 1a supernova. It is based on a particular binary star setup, and it is recognizable via light profiles and spectral analysis. Here's how it works. 1. A massive red giant star has a small stellar companion. 2. Mass flows from the giant to the dwarf through the L1 Lagrange point. You'll remember Lagrange points from our discussion on Jupiter in the segment on our solar system. 3. The mass of the dwarf star increases. And 4. Once the mass of the smaller star reaches a critical level, its ability to hold off collapsing under the force of gravity comes to an end. The result is a total collapse inside a few seconds. This creates a supernova explosion that rips the smaller star to pieces. So let's take a look at some of the fantastic celestial remnants of stars destroyed by supernova explosions photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. A supernova releases so much light that it can outshine a whole galaxy of stars put together. The exploding star sweeps out a huge bubble in its surroundings, fringed with actual stellar debris, along with material swept up by the blast wave. This glowing, brightly colored shell of gas forms a nebula that we call a supernova remnant. Such a remnant can remain visible long after the initial explosion fades away. This veil nebula is the shattered remains of a supernova that exploded some five to 10,000 years ago. We are zooming into sections of the Veil Nebula photographed by Hubble. This series of images provides beautifully detailed views of the delicate, wispy structure resulting from this cosmic explosion. Although only a few stars per century in our galaxy will end their lives in this spectacular way, 
These explosions are responsible for making all chemical elements heavier than iron in the universe. The Veil Nebula is part of a larger nebula known as the Cygnus Loop. The Cygnus Loop marks the edge of a bubble-like expanding blast wave from a colossal stellar explosion which occurred about 15,000 years ago. This image shows a small portion of this nebula. Japanese and Chinese astronomers recorded this violent event nearly 1,000 years ago in 1054. Called the Crab Nebula, it derived its name from its appearance in a drawing made by an Irish astronomer, Lord Rossi. The orange filaments are the tattered remains of the star and consist mostly of hydrogen. The rapidly spinning neutron star embedded in the center of the nebula is a dynamo powering the nebula's eerie interior bluish glow. The blue light comes from electrons whirling at nearly the speed of light around magnetic field lines from the neutron star. The neutron star, like a lighthouse, ejects twin beams of radiation that appear to pulse 30 times a second due to the neutron star's rotation. This kind of neutron star is called a pulsar. Just over a thousand years ago, the stellar explosion known as Supernova 1006 was observed. It was brighter than Venus and visible during the day for weeks. The brightest supernova ever recorded on Earth, this spectacular light show was documented in China, Japan, Europe, and the Arab world. Ancient observers were treated to the celestial fireworks display without understanding its cause or implications. We now understand that SN1006 was a Type 1A supernova. In 1976, the first detection of exceedingly faint optical emissions of the supernova remnant were recorded. A tiny portion of this filament is revealed in detail by this Hubble observation. The twisting ribbon of light corresponds to locations where the expanding blast wave from the supernova is now sweeping into very tenuous surrounding gas. The size of the remnant implies that the blast wave from the supernova had expanded at nearly 20 million miles per hour every hour for over 1,000 years. The Chinese witnessed this supernova event in 185 AD, documenting a mysterious guest star that remained in the sky for eight months this combined visible light and X-ray image shows the interstellar gas that has been heated to millions of degrees by the passage of the shock wave from the supernova. RCW86 is approximately 85 light years in diameter. If it were the star Capella, the shock wave would be tearing us apart right now. Here we are zooming into the surviving companion star to a titanic supernova explosion witnessed in the year 1572 by the great Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. On November 11, 1572, Tycho Brahe noticed a star in the constellation Cassiopeia that was as bright as the planet Jupiter. No such star had ever been observed at this location before. It soon equaled Venus in brightness. For about two weeks, the star could be seen in daylight. At the end of November, it began to fade and change color, from bright white to yellow and orange to faint reddish light, finally fading away from visible light in March 1574. Tycho's meticulous recording of the brightening and dimming of the supernova now allow us to identify its light signature as that of a Type 1a supernova. This supernova star's shredded remains are called Cassiopeia A, or Cass A for short. Cass A is the youngest known supernova remnant in our Milky Way galaxy. The light from this exploding star reached Earth in the late 1600s. This photo shows the upper rim of the supernova remnant's expanding shell. The colors highlight parts of the debris where chemical elements are glowing. The dark blue fragments, for example, 
are richest in oxygen. The red material is rich in sulfur. These Spitzer infrared space telescope images show shifting patterns of glowing dust beyond the remnant itself. These changes are so fast they indicate motion at the speed of light. These are light echoes, just like what we saw with the star Monos Aridos. The light from a supernova can take hundreds of years to reach surrounding dust clouds. Following the arrows of light, it's clear we'll see the supernova flash first. The light echoing off the dust clouds will arrive later, at various times, delayed by hundreds of years from the original flash. So we're not seeing the dust move near the speed of light. We're seeing the light from the supernova move through the dust. It's Spitzer that can detect the brief boost in the thermal infrared glow. 400 years ago, sky watchers, including the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler, were startled by the sudden appearance of a new star in the western sky, rivaling the brilliance of nearby planets. Modern day astronomers examined the remnants in infrared radiation and x-rays. You can see the value of going beyond visible light. Hubble's light image doesn't see the full nature of the supernova remnant. The X-ray and infrared cameras do. A violent and chaotic looking mass of gas and dust is seen in this Hubble Space Telescope's image of a supernova remnant, denoted N63A. Many of the stars in the immediate vicinity of N63A are extremely massive. It is estimated that the progenitor of the supernova that produced the remnant, seen here, was about 50 times more massive than our own sun. Two decades ago, astronomers spotted one of the brightest exploding stars in more than 400 years, Supernova 1987A. Here we have an archival photographic plate of the star before it exploded, next to one where it had. Here we zoom into the fascinating image of the asymmetric pattern of the exploding star surroundings. The most prominent feature in the image is a ring with dozens of bright spots. A shock wave of material unleashed by the stellar blast is slamming into regions along the ring's inner regions, heating them up and causing them to glow. Astronomers detected the first bright spot in 1997, but now they see dozens of spots around the ring. Only Hubble can see the individual bright spots. Although star clusters come in a variety of sizes and magnitudes, it appears that the brightest globular clusters have a similar luminosity. This makes them a good standard candle. We can also add supernovas to our distance ladder. Type 1a supernova provide a candle as accurate as Cepheid variables, but with the advantage that they can be seen clearly at much larger distances. In the next section, we'll take a look at the most spectacular nebulae in the Milky Way.